So good morning, everyone. The first response that I received today. Perfect. You're great already. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about PDFA. And I might use some strange points of view um, because that was the way that I personally like to talk about PDFA. But when I'm talking about me, actually the question is, who is that guy standing in front of you? My name is François Fernandes. As you can clearly see by my name, it's a, it is a classical German name. Um, I ba I'm basically real European. I am a mixture of everything. Um, I am a document technology evangelist. Whatever that means, I have no idea. And I'm working for a German company, um, Beliefical Solutions, GmbH, um, and we're experts in the area of document viewing, um, not only PDF, but also other um, document formats. And I've been working there. My first day in that company was um, my boss coming to me saying, hey, look, I have a small book for you called PDF Reference. Go ahead and implement a reader for us. And this is the reason why I went a little bit mad. Um, but as a result, I'm staying here today. And I'm the chairman of the PDF Competence Center and of the PDF Association and board member of the PDF Association. So, enough about me. Let's get started. Who of you has ever heard of PDFA before? Who's confused about PDFA? It's interesting. Okay, I wasn't expecting that. Okay. So this is a picture that you might have in your head. Is that correct? We have A1A, A1B, A2B, U, and so on. And most people tend to be confused about that, which is quite sad. I'd like for today reduce the whole discussion to a few things. First of all, I would like to reduce our discussion basically to PDF A1. A2 and 3B. Well, that's the wrong one highlighted, but anyway. Um, and even more, I'd like to reduce our discussion to PDFA in general. Why am, am I doing this? A lot of people are confused about all those terms that are around in that area of PDFA in some way, about the different versions, about the different conformance levels. And they tend to stop thinking about what PDFA is because they get a little bit lost in all those details. So let's step back a little bit. And I would like to describe or say what PDFA is about. I've brought some examples for today. And one thing that is important for me, I'm just um, uh, mixing that in right here. If you have any questions at any time, please give me a sign, and I will try to answer your questions. I pretty much like, love it to have interactive presentations. So you're really meant to be participating, as you already did with um, greeting me, which was awesome. So I count on you. One thing, and m probably mo most important thing to think about PDFA is, it is meant to be a replacement for paper. That's the purpose of PDFA. As such, and if we think about paper, it is something static. We have those contents statically laid out on paper, and it will be the same way, and that's intentional with PDFA. It is reliable. A sheet of paper you pretty much can count on. So important documents, most people tend to print because they want to be sure that they know the location and that it cannot be, uh, get lost. And basically, it is a preservable version or kind of a digital paper. This is how we should think about PDFA. And as such, PDFA is simply speaking, blocking some things. 
As you might have seen, probably from the talk of um, Leonard right in front of me, uh, PDFA is, uh, no, PDF, sorry, PDF is so powerful in what it can actually achieve on, or do or interact, etc. We have audio capabilities, we can ha add multimedia, we can add um, things like JavaScript to do pretty fancy stuff, and even much more. And PDFA is kind of a protection shield to exclude those contents which are typically not meant to be preserved over a long time, which are mostly meant to be somehow entertaining or as kind of side information or whatever, this is your protection shield, PDFA. And if you go out here, um, I'd pretty much love to, uh, to think of you, but you're seeing PDFA as a, as a guardian to get all that mess out of the way. This is one way I'm thinking what about, about uh, yeah. what, what about link? Could a link be in a PDFA? A link could be in a PDFA. There has been a, uh, a lot of discussion. Um, if you have links that are leaving the PDF document, meaning hyperlinks to any kind of web page or whatever, the PDF specification states that such links should be made non-actionable. It's not a shell, so um, pretty import important thing. The PDFA specification is an ISO standard, and we distinguish between the words should and shall. Should is a recommendation, shall is a requirement. So typically, it should not be actionable. That means, for example, Adobe Reader, if you click on that link to some recent version, um, it didn't actually open the page because it was blocked. Due to the fact it is a PDFA document, the Adobe Reader detects that and stops doing the interaction. You're disturbing me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that um, okay for you? Perfect. You're already participating. I love that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, again, I didn't understand it. Oh, you don't allow certain annotations in the PDFA file. Um, and annotations are allowed with restrictions. Okay. On, um, I w I'd like to say it um, that way around because it is not only about disallowing some annotations like anything multimedia, etc., or attachments. It is about allowing annotations in a specific manner. For example, hyperlinks have to behave in a specific way. They are not disallowed, but they are not as uh, the way they are with, uh, in the normal PDF specification. So it is all limited to some degree. Works for you? Okay. So the other thing, what I'm thinking PDFA about, or when I'm thinking about PDFA, um, it is, in my opinion, PDFA makes documents actually future-proof. Typically, if you're facing a document, or a file on your desktop, anything, what you want is using the appropriate tool to open the document, then loading the document and be happy because you can see all the contents. Now, reality, and not here I'm not talking about um, only PDF. There are so many different document formats out there. The reality, especially if you if it's going into archiving, this is what PDF A is meant for. Reality is looking like this. We have to somehow detect the data format. We, um, if we don't know the format at all. For an example, do you know a file with an ex extension of? Um, Punkt, uh, dot .doc, what kind of document is that? Yeah, you're wrong, because it's um, some kind of event product in, in the 80s that has also had the, that, that extension. Um, so 
I don't even remember the name. So I'm, I'm pretty much in a, a painful situation right now. I'm facing such a document. I have no clue where to get the appropriate tool from. So I have to be in search for some, someone who has been responsible um, for curating such documents who might even know something about it. In most cases, it's not going to work. Um, and I actually tried to consult a visionary, didn't have either. And if I'm looking at, at this um, flow plan, flow chart, or whatever, I pretty much like one special branch here. This is also known, for me at least, as the um, confidential information way. So a little, little story about um, one of our customers. They have, have had a lot of documents in their, scanned documents, in their archive. Generated some in between the 80s and the 90s. And it was a format that resembled TIFF, but it wasn't really TIFF. We found actually the um, person who created those documents, or to be more precisely, the vendor, which was the archive vendor it's, um, itself. And we've been asking them for the specification or any kind of tool to get that format for our customer going. And the only information that we have been receiving is, sorry, can't do that because it's confidential information. We've managed to find out that um, from internal employees that they actually lost the specification. So, well, there have been a lot of people pretty much in trouble. This is something that cannot happen with PDFA. Why? Because it is a c based on a common standard. We're talking basically about PDF. PDF is widely known. And it, PDFA is an international ISO standard. It is publicly accessible. And of course, it is PDF. It is basically a best practice guideline for how to use PDF in a way that it's going to be reproducible in uh, many years from now on. And one of the most important things is we are talking about a document format which has a large community, an amazing, really, really large community. There are a lot of people on the world which at least know some bits of PDF. What else? For me, an important thing, PDFA is complete. Why do I mean with complete? First of all, anyone of, from Adobe in the room? I've been asking about in my session before. No Adobe employees? You are? That's perfect. Because I'm going to blame Adobe for, uh, for a lot of things, and I don't want to, to do that without any employees to be here. No, just kidding. Um, one thing to note. Successfully loading a document in Adobe Reader does not mean that that document is complete or correct in any way. I don't know how Adobe ma actually managed that, but they have kind of implemented a visionary within the Adobe Reader because any kind of byte crap you can throw, toss into um, the direction of the reader and he will be able to, to um, do something with it. So congrats guys, but Wow, amazing. Especially when it comes to things like additional resources. For example, fonts, my favorite topic. Um, we have a lot of different font file formats. For example, type one, true type, open type, and we're add, um, yet more. <coughs> and the worst thing of all, and this is a big point uh, for discussion, PDF not PDFA, does not strictly require fonts to be embedded. PDFA, in contrast, does strictly require fonts to be embedded. This is um, a discussion that I've been uh, making a lot of times. Yeah, sure. When you say embedded, you mean subsetted or fully embedded? Subsetted. It's um, when we're talking about embedding fonts in PDF, <coughs> and PDFA, we're not talking about integrating the whole font file. You are allowed to integrate a subset, like you say, um, in a manner that 
all your glyphs, all your characters that you're using are actually available. But it is a kind of a discussion. Who has had the discussion or asked himself, why do I have to embed fonts in PDF A documents? No one has asked that question? OK. Well, I've been um, in a lot of discussions around that subject. Let's look at an example. I have here a um, simple insurance application form. So here's the story about that document. It has been archived five years ago. It is basically a simple insurance application form. Um, digitally de generated, of course. It's not a scanned document. And it was modern. It was signed <laughs> using a pen pad. Yay. And it was generated as a non-PDFA document. Now, from first sight, this document looks pretty decent. But sometime, there's a, chain, a change. For some reason, there has been um, a review of a document because of an um, actual um, insurance case or whatever. And there have been some interesting entries in um, been seen during the review. For example, this line. Do you plan to rob a bank or commit any other kind of crime? I personally think if I'm checking yes here, I will not get my, ins my um, life insurance. I, I have no idea. It's probably like that in Germany. Is it different in the US? Um, probably not. But if we're looking even further, because we are, um, it caught our att uh, attention this document. So ha let's have a look at other points. The question, are you a human life form has been answered with no. I personally think, first thing, but I, I, I would be thinking at that point is, they are watching us. We should, someone should uh, go and call SETI. They are already on Earth. OK, what was what's going wrong? And this is. Of course, the document is made up. The case is not. Companies tend to love to generate their own custom company private funds with all kinds of fancy stuff in it. For example, checkboxes. So we, you have fund files which have checked and unchecked checkboxes. Oh, that was, was a lot of check. Um, and both of them are kind of um, letters. So they are included, and this font has not been embedded. This font has been modified multiple times throughout the history of, the, uh, um, of that company, and there have been encoding changes in it. Again, not a, the document is made up, the case is not. And yeah, which version is the right one to, to choose? And here we are, we are facing a, actually a problem, because the quality of the uh, reproduction of the document is heavily dependent on the system you're actually running. So that, let's have a, look, a little closer look. I'm not going to bore you with all the details about uh, the PDF font lookup, but this is kind of a view of how PDF is working. You have a lot of machinery um, being integrated and participating in searching for the actual characters that you, you to do their visual representation. And you see that there's a major part of it within the actual true type font file. And if you're not embedding the font, that means you're not putting that font inside the PDF document, all those um, actions that have to be taken to show the document, which involve a true type font, are system dependent. You cannot count on, on those uh, kinds of documents in the future. And this is the reason why PDF A is actually requiring fonts in, uh, in particular and other resources to be strictly embedded in any way. <coughs> so we've gone through that. Now, what else could, um, is PDF about? For me, what really amazing thing is, 
PDFA is actually validatable. Who knows what a validator is? Oh, I, I want to see more hands, please. Don't be shy. Matt, be, yeah, thank you. <coughs> okay, not too many people. Okay, um, what I've seen a lot is people are archiving their documents. They come from somewhere on the internet. Email um, archiving is my favorite topic. Imagine you get you receive an email with a PDF generated by who knows who, and this document is without further uh, without further ado placed directly into the long-term archive. And now you're faced to load that document 10 years after it has been archived. What a great fun. Messing around with non-embedded fonts and stuff like that. Now, validating is the task of checking a document for being pretty correct in terms of its syntax, being complete in terms of its resources. And this is something that um, PDFA has brought up intensely. Because starting with the um, first release of PDFA, there have been many PDFA validators out there checking whether or not that document is actually applying those PDFA specific rules. So you can pre-check your documents that you're putting in your archive verify that those documents are going to be um, or going to follow the PDFA <coughs> guidelines. So as I said, what are common, common problems? General document structure is broken. Again, Adobe Reader is doing an amazing job in getting such documents um, shown. <coughs> we have broken resource data, for example, fonts or we, you have so many font files out there which are completely messed up because no one's actually validating it. And of course, images, color, etc. Now, and that is what PDF actually is about. It is a guide of best practices. To reproduce a document, it is a best, best practice to have all resources for the future. So best practice, number one, Embedded fonts, I will um, say that again a million t uh, times today because I love that statement. And it's easy to validate that this rule is applied because it is clear that it has to be like that. PDF does not require that to be, in, um, to be embedded. And in addition, PDFA has a lot of clear statements. For example, we have different versions of PDFA. I'm just Sneaking into that for a moment. Transparency. Yeah, you know, transparent objects on, um, on your page. Um, has been a lot of discussion for a long time. Especially um, for the first PDFA version, which is base, was later on PDF 1.4. And as it was not clear under the PDF specification on how to actually apply transparency to a document, the solution was to disallow transparency. To ensure that all rules or any content that is included in a PDF A document will be easily reproducible in the future, based on the information that we have today. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying there are clear statements. If there's something unclear in the PDF specification, PDFA goes right into it, uh, say stop at this point, and this is allowed and this is not. And these rules are perfectly validatable. Is that true of the latest version of PDFA? Transparency huh. No. Give me a second. Okay. Because I'll come back to the version drama um, in, some, in, in a moment. Um, so to sum that up, what is PDFA for me? And not only for me, it's my, I think it's the only way that we should look and think about PDFA. PDFA is meant to be a full replacement for paper, a 100% um, replacement for paper. It makes documents 
future proof. Not guesswork, no guesswork needed. And of course, um, we will not face the um, confidential, inform uh, confidential information trap. PDFA is complete because you have anything that you need to process the document on board inside the document at any time. PDFA documents are not required or do not require external resources. It's a package. And PDFA is, due to the kind of rules that are applied to it, perfectly validated. This is how I think about PDFA, and I hope um, you will too. Yes? Uh, is there a checksum involved of any kind, like an There are possibilities. You can sign a document. I won't go into the direction because I hate all that signature stuff. <laughs> um, but basically, it's not um, a required part of the PDFA document, but you can apply uh, digital signatures. In my opinion, because we're talking about um, byte level consistency of a file during time, this is a job that a typically long term archive should do. So if you're archiving your document, that is the job of it, that archive to ensure that you have those, um, that it is consistent over time. Yeah? multiple companies. Um, and in fact, if you're looking on the PDF Association homepage, um, pdfa.org, there is actually a big list of different vendors um, with their solutions in the area, area of PDF. And one of the biggest lists of products is actually the validators list. Because as I said, that this has been a topic starting with PDFA um, that became quite important. And most people tend to really understand and appreciate that validators does exist. Because for example, um, TIFF documents have been going into the archive without further checking in any way. Um, and today, there's a lot of pain involved in loading those documents because many of them are broken. And this is something we would like to avoid with PDFA. And this is why. Um, PDFA validators came up a lot. Go ahead, please. Sorry, I need to go back to digital signatures on that you only hate the most because that's one of the pain points. My too, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, that's a pretty, pretty, pretty good question. Um, this is where things get complicated indeed. You have both options. The better way would be to have a PDFA document before doing any kind of um, signature. Yeah, it's in, a, in an ideal way, it would be actually a PD, almost PDFA document. So conforming to all the rules, then the, P the signing pad converts that thing into a static representation containing the signature, the visu visual part of it, and makes a PDF or A document, and then signs that document. This way is the easiest way, because if you have to do um, additional corrections on the PDF file, embedding resources, doing uh, minor corrections and stuff like that, um, you can do that and all those corrections will be signed. If you're first signing that document and doing a PDFA conversion after that, you will have to add additional information and probably override some information. So you 
will have a signed version of the original PDF document not being a PDF-A document and an extension of that PDF document being a PDF-A document with all the corrections required. And there's, it is, it is possible to validate whether or not there are substantial changes to the document after it has been signed, but that's pretty much complicated. You shouldn't go there. Ideally, generate PDFA in any of the processes, always. Do never, ever generate anything else except if you really have to. That's my suggestion. I've seen a, a hind behind bear. I'm sorry. I take you uh, in, in a second. Sorry. Yes. Yep. Can you have any form of redaction of security in the PDFA document after You mean encryption and password protection, etc.? More closer to the redaction issue. Let's say social security number one time. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a general question. Um, you. Ideally, you, you should tr uh, create the PDF A document after you redacted that content. And redacting um, such content is actually pretty a challenging task because you must ensure that all those objects are not only hidden by some kind of overlay, they must be removed. Um, There's an OCR layer. Exactly, such, such things. It has to be removed. It is quite challenging, and I am not aware of many tools that are doing a decent job in doing redaction in, in that way. But this is actually a, a pretty, it's not PDFA specific, um, it is a general PDF um, concern or question, actually. So you're in next. If I'm presented with a PDF file, is there any easy way or determining if it is PDFA compliant? Yeah. Um, if we're talking about uh, Adobe Arena. I'm, I'm doing a little bit of advertising for Adobe here. Um, but uh, typically, if you're opening a PDFA document, it is marked as being a PDFA compliant file with some kind of banner at the top um, stating this um, editing has been disabled because it's, it is in PDF, a PDFA document. Um, the important thing here is to see that it is Adobe Reader is not validating that this is a PDF A document. It's just checking the contents. And if there are specific <coughs> entries in the PDF document stating that this, is, this file is actually a PDF A document, so go ahead and process it like a PDF A document. If you really want to be sure that what you're looking at is a PDF A document, please use a validator. And there are a lot of them. OK, no problem. Yeah. There's a lot of them. And if you, again, head over, whoa, wow, many questions. Um, and if you're heading to the PDF Association homepage, you will see um, a lot of tools ex doing exactly that. Most combined with a validator. I'm taking your, yeah. Yes. Um, it is in the, in Adobe Reader, it is in the uh, um, document information or the doc or document properties, somewhat, something like that. And I, sorry? Yeah, it's, in not, it's not in the doc document information dictionary. It's actually, if you're looking from a UI point of view, typically Adobe Reader, you have the document properties. Let's have a look. Oh, I'm doing that on camera. It's never a good idea. I don't know. Properties. Um, we have the, oh, they changed that view a lot. I'm lost here. OK. Ah, OK. You have this additional metadata. And for PDFA documents, we have a um, sp specific PDFA section in this, um, in this dialog so that we can have a look at whether or not this, this document is going to be PDFA or claims to be a PDFA document. This is not the only way. There are a lot of checking tools out there. Just checking the, the PDF document, um, whether or not 
that header is, has been set or not. The metadata has been set to specify that it is actually a PDFA document. And it's pretty much pretty easy to, act, to check a um, PDFA document yourself, but it's because it's clear text XML somewhere in the file. And you can easily search for the start and end markers. It's the so-called XMP. If you want more details about XMP, I think we will have a talk today. Not sure where it will be, but there is, a, uh, there is one. Sure. What about password protection? And that's just a PDFA? No. Um, and I am so happy that it isn't possible to do password protection. Because password protection is not only about protecting the document from unauthorized success. It is also about claiming rights for that document and possibly prohibiting long-term preservation of that document. So encryption and digital rights is generally disabled and not allowed in PDFA at all. Thank you. Welcome. OK, yeah. You, uh, sure, you can. You can go ahead and um, put a PDFA document into a, um, any kind of container that does kind of a, right, a rights management. You have to have the uh, appropriate uh, application to actually enforce that. But a PDFA document, if it's open in a reader which doesn't know anything about any kind of rights, um, will not let you do a lot of things with, uh, with um, or not, will not limit you regarding the PDFA document because, per definition, a PDFA document is without any kind of digital rights. And typically, that, that's, these are things that should be um, solved by the processing systems ar uh, around that, in that document. So if you have an archive which um, should, or this archive should enforce um, any kind of rights for people accessing or not accessing that document, it should be not part of the document. That's, that's basically the idea of, of PDFA at this point. OK. No more questions? I'll go ahead then. Oh, come on. So this is the, actually the last part. I just wanted to have a um, quick look at the history of PDFA, especially to um, address the confusion about the version, the version numbering. So PDFA started pretty much in 2005 with the ISO 19005-1. Nineteen this is the first version of PDFA called PDFA1. PDFA1 is based on PDF1.4. That means it ex explicitly references the specification 1.4, including all the features that are allowed or possible with, uh, within PDF 1.4 with the restrictions of, the, uh, of PDF 8. Example, font embedding, non-multimedia, etc. In addition, it introduced, and this is, I know, quite a source for a lot of confusion, different conformance levels. We'll get back to the conformance level in a second. Now the history did go on with something quite um, interesting. <coughs> Adobe handed over the um, specification of PDF itself to the ISO. It is the ISO 32000-1, which represents the PDF 1.7 specification. <laughs> and there is, um, included things like JPEG 2000, object streams, portable collections. Um, it's called portfolio um, in Adobe Reader or in Acrobat. And things like optional content. And there's a lot of additional stuff. And now it comes to the versioning of PDFA. We have PDFA 2, um, which has been released 2011. And in contrast to the first version, this one is based 
on the ISO 32000-1, the ISO version of PDF 1.7. So one ISO document, and this is a pretty um, beautiful thing, that ISO document for PDF I2 references another ISO document, so a publicly available specification. These are the most, most known um, versions of PDFA. And then we have the little brother, PDFA3. It is, and you, if you see, uh, have a look at the dates. PDFA2 is, has been released to 2011. In 2012, we already had PDFA3. And the way I would like you to think about PDFA3 is PDFA2 plus plus. It's basically a PDFA3 file is nothing else than a PDFA2 <coughs> file, same baseline version, ISO 32000-1, with one single exception or ch <coughs> uh, major change. PDFA3 allows embedding of non-PDFA files into the document. This is the only difference. And as a general rule of thumb, if you want to use um, PDFA, do not really think about PDFA3 unless you have a reason to do so. So again, personally, my suggestion, shall you take, uh, which version, version should you take? PDF A1, A2, A3? My personal thought is, don't care about the version that much. <coughs> Use PDF A. Be it PDF A1, be it PDF A2, be it uh, PDF A3. The most important thing is, if you want to do document archiving and long-term preservation, use PDF A and do not question too much about which version you're going to use. And that's about it for me. And I'm ho I was hoping that I'm getting even more questions. Please go ahead. Um, I work for a, a publishing company that does a lot of legal publishing. And um, if we wanted to archive legal things, of course, you're going to have many thousands of links <laughs> to other opinions and so forth, legal opinions. Would that be allowed? Well, um, you, you, can ha you can establish links in multiple ways. You could, for example, use uh, plain hyperlinks. As I said, um, they should not be actionable. This is the thing that I've, I've been saying before. Another way could be to actually say uh, or include meta information into the metadata of a document pointing to other, other documents using your custom way of doing references. This is one possible way to achieve that.